Hello, Instagram. You tonight, you're in for a treat because I have Dr. Thomas Lodi joining me. And if you don't know him, you need to know him because he is brilliant. Uh, and absolutely just so ahead of his time, such a novel thinker, but there he is. Wow, Hello. it worked. Hello. How, how's, Hi. Your, how's your Thursday on my Wednesday? Well, my Thursday is just beginning, but this, uh, it's crazy. This, so Instagram only allows us to do this by phone. Yeah. It's okay because wow. we're going to put this, we'll put this everywhere. We'll put it on Facebook and we'll put it on YouTube and lots of people will be able to catch it. No, but I mean, I just mean in, ter in terms of the, um, the, the, it, it, the, the audio, everything is not as good on the phone, but that's cool. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. So I feel like your time is so valuable. So I really want to get right to it because I know that your um, perspective is so refreshing and is going to be so helpful for so many people. So first, let's like start us off and talk about like what is breast cancer? What's happening there? Because I think most people think that they get breast cancer, they have a bad breast. Oh, so what, what, was, the, what was the question again? Yeah, what is breast cancer? What's happening in the body? Oh, wow, that's bad audio. Let me see what I can do. Hold on. It sounds... Uh, We're having technical difficulties? It, yeah, no, no, it just sounded so grumbled. What, please, please, one more time. And also, you're frozen. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was saying that most people, when they get a breast cancer diagnosis, they're under the impression that they have a bad breast, right? Yeah. So I yeah. wanted you to talk to people about what is actually happening when people get breast cancer. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, um, first of all, uh, I, I think it's important to understand something, is that the biology of cancer is the biology of cancer. And, um, and the reason we, you know, we, we always separate uh, they, they use the word type, which really uh, infuriates me because it's not type. It's just location, you know, breast, ovary, uterus, colon, pancreas. The second word is cancer. The first word is location. And yeah. so now, why do they differ? It's because of the different organs um, functions and, 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 and drainage systems and, and things like that. So they, the, the, the difference is that, but the fundamental biology of cancer is the biology of cancer um, and we know what it is you know we we know since 1931 it's a um, it's basically you know the Otto Warburg put it very simply by saying failure of cellular respiration in those days they didn't know what mitochondria were now we do and we know if you knock out 40 percent 50 percent the cell has to start fermenting it's a homeostatic corrective response and by the way I worked with a Dr. Kobayashi for 25 years in uh, Japan, sadly, sadly passed away recently. But um, uh, he had a test. Uh, it, it was a test called tumor marker combination assay, which the Mayo Clinic didn't believe that it was real. So they sent him 100 tubes of blood. You know, some were frozen blood before someone has was ever diagnosed with cancer, and some were not cancer, and some were children and babies and all. Anyway, he was 88% accurate, which blew their minds because that's more accurate than a PET scan. So um, uh, anyway, so he looks at what he did. He just looks at different, um, different things, some, some, some parameters that you would use only in research and then some that you and I know, are familiar with. And he had algorithms. And he can see if you had nanograms, micrograms, milligrams, or one gram or more. So when you get a little lump in your breast, you, then you've got a gram or more. So that means that would put you at, on, under his classification as a TMCA5. Right, and so, um, but, uh, so his, his five is our one. So, um, I, his, yeah, his five is our one, right. So, but what I want everyone to understand too, I don't believe their staging system either. I don't believe anything they say. And I know I sound like a freak, <laughs> but, but I don't believe anything they say. If they tell me it's Tuesday, I'm gonna check my calendar. So. Um, <laughs> okay, so what, 
what is it about the way that cancer is addressed in this, in, well, all over the world, really, in that conventional medical model? What is it about that model that you don't agree with? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, and, and every day, every day I talk to women all over the world. I don't, every continent, every, you know, I, that, that's what I do. And I, breast cancer, you know, li listen, it's like the leading cause of death in women now. And, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't. And in fact, when, when, when in 1907, when they started this whole thing, there was a 0.07% of the population died from cancer. And from that, they decided to make American Cancer uh, Society, which it eventually became that. Um, uh, it was a Rockefeller thing. And anyway, um, you know, and now 40% of the people in America are, 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 are succumbing to cancer or dying. Um, so anyway, I don't know how they predicted it, but they're pretty amazing. But anyway, so what I'm seeing is the same old thing. And please, everyone, realize, that the doctor you're sitting in front of is not looking at you as a human being and thinking and looking at your data and saying, hmm, what should I do? No. They're getting, they want, the, they, they know what they've got algorithms. And the algorithms are, they call it guidelines, but they're really instructions. And they're telling the doctor, this is what you must do. And if you don't do this, you're not going to be held high in your, uh, your colleagues. Um, your, your professional standing will go down and everything. And so since most doctors took Hippocratic oath to their career rather than to their patients, then they, they, go, uh, they go along with that. So what are they gonna do? Always, they wanna cut it, biopsy it, and then cut, either cut, do a lumpectomy or do a mastectomy, um, and do genetic testing, and da, 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 da. And all of it's for, and I, want, and I know I'm, trying, I'm talking fast, but I'm, you know, it's, it's to get the nomenclature that they have, and all they have, all they give you is what's called a histological description and histology is simply microscopic anatomy looking at the at the um, uh, uh, at the at the details of a tissue so they take it out and they go aha this is invasive ductal carcinoma and you think oh my god this guy's so smart this lady's so smart no it just said oh it was in the duct it invaded through the wall and it's a carcinoma not a sarcoma oh okay all right doc Brilliant doctor. Now what? Uh, uh, can you tell me two things that I'd like to know? How did I get this, and how do I get rid of this? Well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> not that. Can't go that far. But anyway, so they spend a lot of money to come up with a name, and uh, and that's it. And they get the name because the name they can stick into their uh, Rockefeller, excuse me, algor algorithm, uh, which is basically a sales algorithm. It sells you uh, products and services. Yeah. And, um, so what, and that, and that, what should we be thinking about instead? Like, what, how can that person that receives that diagnosis, how can they be empowered, and what should they be doing? What should they be thinking about? Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so what they should be doing is, first of all, never, ever step foot again in the House of Horrors. In the house. <laughs> Just never do okay. that. Okay. Never, never, ever talk to an oncologist, ever. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, find yourself a good functional doctor who's been well-trained in allopathic medicine and knows the other side. They have to know both sides. You know, they can't, they can't just know. You can, you, that's, why, that, that's the one problem I have. Uh, like, I, I'm very fortunate. One of my naturopaths is um, uh, almost an allopath. I mean, because she's had her, she worked with, you know, anyway, so because, so, but you got to have someone who knows both sides so they can, because it's never, there's no one discipline that has all the answers. You've got to be able to um, uh, know when to do what, you know, you got a brain tumor growing and you better do some radiation quickly, right? And it depends on the situation. You've got to know when, um, and that's, that's very important. So what I'd like someone to do when they first find out is to say, take a breath and realize Hey, if I have a lump, let's say you just have a lump, you just have like a, a mass in your breast. Okay, it's been at least eight years in the making, so there's nothing I have to do Monday. I don't have to go Monday and cut things off. Yeah, I, I think I, that is you, such an important point that people are so often just rushed into treatment, right? They're, they're, made, they're made to think that it is an emergency exactly. and then they have to get scheduled for surgery right away or get a port put in and start chemo right away. And I think what you said, take a breath. That is such an important
important point because with very rare exception, you have time. Exactly. Exactly. And there are, there are, there are situations where, you know, and, and you know, you know, because of this turf, whatever they're calling it, turbo cancer, you know, we're seeing people now, um, you know, early on, you know, with, with advanced stages. So there's different things, you know, different, it's different, but for the most part, no. And it's also something very important is this is a time to please throw away the diagnosis because the diagnosis, as I said, is a histological description. And it, and it also is, it says you've got to realize that it's like they put a spell on you because I talk to people and they talk about their lives well, before I was diagnosed, once I was diagnosed, after I was diagnosed, as soon as my diagnosed, as if that were like a fundamental part of, and, and anyway, and here's what it is. A diagnosis is a snapshot. Now, uh, uh, in the film industry, when they're making a movie, they do what are called stills. They take shots of, uh, of different photographs of people on the set so they can use them for marketing later. Well, if I showed you the still from any movie, you could not tell me what that movie is about. And that's all they do when they take a histological um, um, description. The other thing, by the way, is that remember, the genetic expression of your tumor will change depending on the microenvironment in which it is, because the genetic expression is a consequence. It's like the knee jerk. It's a way to compensate and to succeed in the environment in which a cell is. So we have to understand that the genes are are like uh, the parts department. They're the um, uh, they're the set of all the potential responses a cell can make, and it's making them based on its microenvironment. And so our job is to change that microenvironment. So uh, and through how, eating and how do we do that? How do we control that microenvironment such that it is fostering health instead of promoting disease? Right, right, perfect. Um, and and you know, and one thing I didn't add to the last question was this. It's now time to do due diligence. Someone told you you have a problem. Just say, okay, I have a problem. I've got these chronically fermenting cells in my breast. So, I, so I, 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 let me do my homework. Let me go online. Let me research. Let me find out. Just like if you're going to buy a car, you're not going to go to buy the car for the first person. You're not going to buy a house from the first one you look at. You know, so do your due diligence. This is a little more important decision than buying a house or, or buying a car. So do your due diligence. Feel comfortable with what you know and, and read it. Read it. Yeah, it may be difficult, but try to find, you know, go to a, go to a, a, a research paper and look at the conclusion or, or look at the abstract. Sometimes you can get a lot of information from that. Um, so, you know, do that or confer with other people, talk to other people, get into groups and find out everything before you make any decisions. But whatever you do, if you understand that cancer is a consequence, it's a homeostatic corrective response, and it happens. By the way, if I run up the street right now, um, I haven't been running lately, so it won't take long before my legs will start aching. Why are they aching? Because I've exceeded my aerobic capacity, and I'm producing lactic acid. So if I go, and I blow off all that CO2, then it goes back to being normal. I don't have any pain. Well, what happened when I blew off that CO2 is I went back to using my mitochondria. In the cancer cell, they've lost too many. They're too dysfunctional, so they can't go back. So they're stuck in glycolysis for the most part, right? And so uh, anyway, all of that comes about because of a, an accumulation of toxins. And you can't say, well, what caused my cancer? Well, what didn't? You know, this is the 21st century. You know, we're expo you know, our food, our water, our uh, our lifestyle, our stresses, you know, you know, oh, you, you, uh, you know, your hair's not right, you broke your fingernail, you're late for, uh, you know, things that that really stress people out. And, and so first thing you got to do, do your due diligence. Then if I can tell you the first thing, and I, I know you, no one's going to do it, and I know you're not going to believe me, maybe you will, but go to bed early. I just pr promise you if you go to bed early, your life will change. Because when you go to bed and you make yourself, you put, you put a mask on, you cool the room down, you put earplugs in, you turn off all the electronics, um, yeah, you, you, and you do, a, you do a mind enema before you sleep, you sit down, write down all the things you did today, all the things you need to do tomorrow, all the things you do next week, blah, blah, blah. So you empty your mind so you don't have to think about it. You're not, it's not, it's not a, attacking you when you're trying to sleep. And you go to sleep early because tomorrow begins today.
And it's like getting on the A train. You get on the A train, there's no way you're not going to wind up in Harlem. So, you know, if you, if you, so if you go to bed at 11 o'clock, it's not, it's, you're going to have the same day you had yesterday. The, and here's what happens. And this, I'm doing a, some research on this right now. The incredible um, gift from sleeping early, not just enough sleep, but sleeping early, is willpower. Because there's not a cigarette smoker alive that doesn't know they should quit. There's not an alcoholic that doesn't know that. We, you know, we all know what we should do, but we don't. Why? And, that's, and because if you're tired, if you're on your fourth cup of coffee and you're rushing and you drive by McDonald's, you're going to say, ah, what the hell? And you're going to go do it. But if you got up at four, you did your, you, you know, you did your meditation and prayer and your yoga and your, and your exercise, you're going to feel so fantastic. There's no way you're going to stop and, and destroy that. So you got to go to bed early. That's the one thing I was saying. The other thing is you got to do a cleanse. You gotta get your, clon- get your colon cleansed. You got to do lymphatic therapies. And when they tell you, oh, don't, you're going to make the cancer go into the lymphatics, and that's, you're going to make cause spread. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. People don't drink out of ponds. They drink out of rivers. Flow is life. Flow is energy. You've got to keep your lymphatics flowing. That's what they're there for. And your lymph nodes, by the way, are not your enemy. They're the intelligence, little intelligence headquarters that are making up their mind on how to uh, immunologically respond to this situation. So anyway, you've got to be good to your lymphatic system and um, drink, you know, do a juice cleanse. Do a juice cleanse. Do a three-week juice cleanse. Go on YouTube, watch Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And the reason I want you to watch that is this is a guy who was fat, sick, and nearly dead on all kinds of medication. And he said, oh, okay, I'll do a week. Now, he wound up doing two weeks. He wound up doing eight weeks. His loss his weight, he's off all his medication. And the reason is that he was just a guy. His name was Joe. He was just a regular Joe. I just want you to see that this is not a med- necessarily coming from a doctor. It's not a professional documentary. But it's very empowering. It'll give you, you can say, well, if Joe did it, I can do it. And yeah. do it. Do yeah. it. Just, you, yeah. Um, and, and, and what, tell, just share with us, what is your juice cleanse? Oh, okay. Well, the the basic juice the basic juice recipe that uh, that I use is uh, you need celery and cucumber for the volume of water in them because you're not a lot of water in spinach, not a lot of water in kale, or broccoli, but there's a lot of water in in, in celery and um, uh, cucumber. So you use them to get to get to get the volume, and then uh, you put in and I use spinach and kale. You can put in broccoli, you can put in bok choy, but I just you know keep it simple: spinach and kale and and, and celery, cucumber. Then I put a little lemon. The lemon will take away any bitterness because sometimes you don't, sometimes you might get a bitter kale of the day. You might get a bitter whatever, whatever you're using. Um, so the lemon takes away bitterness and then you put in an apple and an apple will take away the sourness from the lemon. And, and so you put enough in to make it taste good that you look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Don't be afraid of a little bit of, of fruit and, and stuff like that because here's the thing. And I, I'm doing some more research on this, too. In fact, I'm writing a book. It's called uh, Why It Has to Taste Good. Because if it doesn't taste good, and you're doing it because I have to, you're, you're feeling victimized, you're feeling, and you're feeling, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, it'll suppress your immune system. And so any benefit you might have gotten from eating a certain thing or drinking a certain thing will be lost by the immune suppression from feeling, um, you know, like you're, you're, uh, not, you're, you know, my life's not worth living. I have to drink this junk. And I, and, it, and so you're really important that you say that you relish it. And you, I had a guy walk, listen, I, I got to say this. I had a guy walking around with colon cancer all the way in his, in his liver. Very, very, uh, uh, anyway, uh, he's walking around taking that juice, holding it up to the heavens every time he took a sip and saying, thank you, God, and drinking it, yeah. drinking it. This guy had metastatic colon cancer. In six weeks, it was clean PET scan. And, it, and I really, I don't, it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with him. His attitude was, yeah, I got this fantastic opportunity to regain my health. And that's the other thing, please. Our, the reason I don't want you to have a diagnosis, I don't want you, if you get a scan, tell the doctor, go look at it. You don't want to look at it. I don't want you to picture what you, what's in there. And if you have already seen the scan, then I want you to sit down, draw it out, draw out what you, what you think is the tumor. And then next to it, draw that same thing, that same breast with the same tumor in it, 
maybe two breasts, you know, have one normal and one, and then draw it half the size. And then next to that, half the size. And next to that, until there's nothing there. Yeah. Because invariably throughout the day, your mind will land on that tumor. And when it does, I want you to shrink it. So if you think it, shrink it. Okay? Remember that. Because, and then the, the minute you get down to a nice, beautiful, clear, wonderful breast, put some music on or call somebody or quickly, because your mind is going to, you know, you got to get your mind away from that. So, uh, and get pictures of breasts. You know, put breasts, put beautiful breasts around the house. Beautiful. Get, you know, get mammograms, clean mammograms. And, you know, you, you just, I want you to start. It's very, very important to do that. Um, and, yes. So um, I, think, oh. I think an important part of what you're saying is that you have to truly believe that you can get well. Right? That, right. That is the first part. And then you have to behave in a way that is making you well. Right? That is making making you healthy and do those things, do those behaviors that you know, that you know drive health, right? And exactly. so you're, you're talking about starting off with a three-week juice cleanse, and this is basically to nourish your body, right? It's yes. to properly yes. nourish your body so that your body can do what it is supposed to do because our body has the capability of healing. Well, yeah. but we need, to, we need right. to give it what it needs to heal. Exactly, and if anybody has a doubt, just go into the kitchen, get a little knife, slice your finger, and see what happens. You're going to see it bleed, you're going to see it scab, and then in a few days it will be gone. That's yeah. what your body was hardwired to do, and it, it's designed to regenerate, rejuvenate, and procreate. That's so the, why do you think people think that cancer is the exception to that rule? Why do you think we believe that we can heal from a cut or a fracture or something like that, but we can't heal a cancer. Well, uh, sadly, it's the same reason for the the great hoax we just went through. It's uh, it's mass it's mass fear. There's been hundreds of billions of dollars since the 20s spent on the word cancer, and that's why I don't like the word and I don't want to use it. And I, I prefer I have all, everybody I speak to. I want let's call them CFCs, chronically fermenting cells. Because uh, it doesn't have the emotional impact. Because yeah. when you hear that word, when you hear that that word, you're, you're it's like someone just stole your future. Someone just said you're 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 done, and that and and you can't take the and the reason I don't want you to go to the hospital is not be I'm, listen. You break your leg, you got a baby coming out feet first. I mean, there are reasons you got to go to the hospital, but uh, you get you know. But because they they call it the standard of care, and I call it the standard of scare, and they scare you. you into submission, and I've had so many people come in crying, looking around and seeing people with the same diagnosis, and seeing that they didn't they didn't go through all that stuff, and they're just crying. They, I didn't have to do this, and the answer is no, you didn't have to. It might come. Listen, it's not. I'm not saying you're not going to surgery might, might eventually need to be thing, but you don't do the the uh, uh, how do you say it? the the irreplaceable the, um, the you don't do that. That which is permanent first. You, 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 you first work on yeah. stopping yeah. the process. You don't now, here's, do something here's, that's irreversible. Exactly, yeah. Why do that first? Yeah. And yeah. then, um, and, and, and so what we want, and also imagine, imagine you have a, a, I mean, a good size mass. Let's say you have a, a three by five centimeter mass in your breast and, um, and a small mass on your liver. Okay, now. Think about it. If it doesn't, if they don't grow and they don't spread, you you will live a normal life. So your real question to any doctor or to any friend, any consultant is, is not how do I get rid of this? It's how do I stop making this? How do I stop making cancer? And that's what we have to keep our focus on. And so the juice cleanse. Now think about it. Juice is 95% water. So you're just drinking a ton of water. I want you to drink three quarts a day. If you can drink four, drink it. Right, and you're going to do that until you're urinating out of both ends. There, you know, you're just. I want you to just clean out, and you'll be. You, you'll know you're drinking enough when you're peeing all the time. Okay, that's beautiful because you're. What you're doing is we want to change the fluid that surrounds our cells, called the interstitial fluid. Right, and remember, we have two drainage systems and one input. Arteries bring stuff to cells and tissues, and veins take away 90%, and lymphatics take away 10%. So we have two drainage systems. So God's telling us drainage is a little more important than feeding, right? So that turns out to be true. So um, 
So uh, when, you're, when you're drinking all this stuff and you're peeing all the time, you're basically cleaning out that interstitial fluid. So you're changing the water in the aquarium. Very, very important. And think about it. Well, then what about my nutrition? Yeah. Listen, the only thing that juice doesn't have is fat and fiber. It's got carbohydrates. It's got all, it's got all the amino acids. It's got phytonutrients. It's got chelated minerals. It's got all that stuff. In fact, you're getting in one liter of juice more nutrition than the average American gets in two months, three months, in that one liter. So you're, it's highly nutritious. That's why I call it a juice feast, not a fast. So a fast is water. So, and you'll have energy. I mean, this guy was, you go to watch Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. He's got eight weeks. He's still, at, you know, and you can go to, I've had people go 12, 15 weeks. You know, you feel fantastic. You've got energy. You're renewed. And, 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 you know, and there are many, many other things. But the big thing that I love in it is that it changes your attitude. You, really, you start to experience health, and that will improve your immune system. Because in the end, we've got to improve. The, we've got to get the immune system. Because, listen, if your immune system was fully functional, whatever's in your body would be gone in a week. Because this immune system is, like, crazy powerful and smart. It's called God smart. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll take care of it. We just have to, you know, we, we have to really, and that's why I work on the immune system a lot. And there, there, there are really important things you've got to do with that as well. So. Um, there was a question that came across that wants to know why juice and not smoothies? Why aren't you using the, um, the fiber of the vegetables and the, and the fruit? Yeah, good question. Because the fiber is, fiber is important, absolutely, but not now. You know, there's a time to go to sleep. There's a time to wake up, right? You know, uh, Solomon, right? The time for everything, every season. Yeah. Um, there, there, yeah, there's always, there's time, well, this is the time to cleanse. It's not the time to put fiber in your, in your, in your colon. Yeah. So you're, and you're not going to do juice only for a long time. But the purpose of it is so, because if you, use, if you just blend it up and you have a smoothie, you won't be able to get much. Because you're going to get full. You're going to have all that fiber. You're going to get full. And you're basically just turned, you're no longer eating solid food. You're eating liquid food. And that's, that's what you've, 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 you're, you've, you've liquefied the food. So we're saying take the fiber out so that you have all the nutrients, all the mi minus fiber nutrients. Yeah. And you do this for three, four, because it's time to clean. We're changing the water in the aquarium. Then we're going to get into feeding uh, and eating fiber and all those stuff. Chia seeds. I mean, chia seeds are just ridiculously magical importance. I mean, they have all nine amino uh, essential amino acids. They've got a three to one, six, omega six, uh, three to six ratio. So you get all of your fats and it's a soluble fiber. So it goes down to your colon and gets turned into really healthy uh, short chain fatty acids. So it's a, like a really amazing, amazing food. Yeah. Um, and for the person that asked about protein, you know, we are still talking about um, just a three-week period. We're talking about, in the beginning, a kickoff, a, a changing the water in the aquarium, as you refer to it. So we're talking about a limited period of time in which you are cleansing your body and giving it what it needs to allow the healing to start, to allow your immune system to come back online. Because as you said, if your immune system was intact, whatever is happening wouldn't be happening. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and okay. so, well, here's the thing. If you think about what a plant is, uh, uh, a plant, like any leaf, uh, you know, I, I don't care what it is, bok choy or whatever, it, the cruciferous vegetables, cabbage, it doesn't matter, uh, spinach, uh, it's basically the leaf is made up of carbohydrates and amino acids. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay, the fats are in the seeds or the nuts. Right? That's the fat. Because, see, plants provide all three macro nutrients that we need. That's all we need, carbs, fats, and protein. And the protein is amino acids. Well, the plants will have all of the amino acids, so you'll be getting protein. And, you know, I, this, you know we were misled. Uh, can you imagine? We were misled. Of course we're misled on everything. In fact, I, my rule of thumb is that everything we've ever learned is the opposite of the truth. And I think if you work with that, you'll, 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 you'll come a long way. But the strongest, the biggest, most powerful animal with the most protein in their body is the elephant. And the elephant eats nothing, is a vegan. Okay, then you've got the rhino and you've got the hippo. They're all vegans. And then you've got the horse, the gazelle, the zebra. 
try to catch them. You know, these are strong, they're powerful. So not only are they bigger and stronger than lions, and it takes seven lions to take down an elephant, not only are they bigger and stronger, full of protein, but they can run all day instead of three minutes like the cheetah. They run all day because they have more endurance. And guess what? They live, the elephant lives 60 to 90 years. Horse lives 28 to 40 years. Chimpanzee lives 55 years. Cats, dogs, lions, tigers, panthers, 15 years. So strength, endurance, and longevity go to the plant eaters. And I, this is not an opinion. This is biology, zoology. Fact. Fact. It's just fact. Yeah. So Absolutely. don't worry about the protein. Worry about the fat. That's what I want. I want you when you get back to eating. Then I want. I I recommend that we have at our clinic up to sixty percent fat, um, and that's not ketogenic. Everybody's misused that word. Like it's kind of like the word awesome. You know, buying a pretzel. Oh, that's awesome. No, it's not awesome. I'm just buying a pretzel. Um, but uh, anyway, so it's not a ketogenic diet, but it is. We need. Um, if everybody is not yet familiar, I would recommend going and reading up uh, the work of Jared, Dr. Jerry Tennant, who brilliant ophthalmologist. He invented LASIK surgery. He has like six or seven patents. Anyway, the guy's a pretty smart guy, you know, eye surgeon, ophthalmologist. Uh, anyway, he figured out uh, about cellular voltage. And he uh, and cellular voltage is basically the accumulated ATP that we've been able to produce in our, in our cells. Now, the voltage is held in place by the membranes of our cell. And our membranes are what they call biphospholipid, meaning they have a phosphate on one side and a phosphate on the other side, and the middle is a lipid, which means there's two conducting elements. Phosphates conduct water because they have a negative charge. And in the middle, they don't conduct water, so it's an insulator. So two, two conductors separated by an insulator is a capacitor, which holds voltage. And our normal cell, when you're healthy and you're feeling great, is about 22 to 25 millivolts. And you get, when you have cancer, you have to get up to 70 millivolts and to stay there. And if you do, and remember, the other thing about alkalinity and all that, it's very important to understand that if you have a lot of voltage, that means you have a lot of extra electrons. That's the same thing as having a lot of antioxidants, which are electron donors. And that's the same thing as being alkaline, which is an electron donor. So alkalinity, antioxidation, and voltage are all the same thing. And then the, the guys that steal it are acidity um, and uh, oxidation and then, uh, and then low voltage. So anyway, so you've got to be able to get your... In the tuber micro environment, right? That's happening yeah. in the tuber micro environment. And so all of this effort that you're talking about, the initial cleanse and then what you're going to do after, this is to change that the macro environment and also to take, change that tumor micro environment because if you restore the health of that then that tumor does not have that same survival drive right 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 so you're, you're 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 telling your body that it's safe yeah you know, you know you know one example is a lot of people may have heard that it's p10 p-t-e-n right tumor suppressor gets it's turned down in many cancers gets tuned down you know what tunes it back up you know, it reactivates it, broccoli, and all the cruciferous vegetables. They upgrade, they bring it back, they restore it. So I want you to understand, when, they, when they're, they're saying, oh, you've got this mutation and that mutation, no, 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 these aren't mutations. This is downregulation and upregulation. In other words, a gene gets silenced or it gets overexpressed, and that's why, and the reason the, the, the DNA is doing that, it's doing that in response to the microenvironment to survive, right now at this moment in the microenvironment. That's why you, you biopsy uh, the tumor a month later, two months later, you might have it to come. No, now it's triple negative. It was triple positive. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's mutating. No, no, no. It's just, it, it's changing. It, 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 has, it has to turn this gene on and this gene off. So a mutation is Down syndrome. It doesn't matter what you feed. Somebody with Down syndrome, they still have Down, down syndrome. It doesn't matter. So I, well, that's a mutation. So most of the things we're talking, I'm not saying mutations aren't involved in cancer, but I'm just saying most, it's overused word. Most, most of what's happened is uh, an adaptive response, the genetic. Mm -hmm. So like you were just saying, um, uh, the, uh, the two, by changing the tumor microenvironment, now, oh, okay, well, I don't need to downregulate this now. I need to turn this up and I need to turn this down, and, uh, right? And so it, your genetic expression changes, the cell changes, right? So that's, that's the secret. It's 
changing that microenvironment. Yeah. Okay, so again, to reiterate, if you are if you are receiving a new diagnosis, the first thing that you should do, take a breath, take a pause, figure out what's right for you. A great place to start is to do this three-week juice cleanse that we talked about in order to kind of reset, um, uh, change the water in the aquarium, as you said, and allow your body the opportunity to start to heal. And almost everyone has that luxury, right? It's very, it's very rare that you need to do something other than this immediately. Exactly. Right? Wouldn't you agree? Exactly. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And almost, and even if you have to do something else, like let's say, you know, the situations that I think are urgent are the tumor is about to uh, impact a vital function like breathing or eating or bowel movements, or, right? Or, or, not a lot of or it's excruciatingly painful, nothing can get, can, you know, or. Uh, you know, it's on the spinal cord or it's in the brain. You know, there are certain situations where, but most of the time you have the luxury to do that. And once you do that, I just had a woman um, from in Europe, Europe somewhere, in Finland, uh, so anywhere. So she was saying that uh, she was, she did all this, it put, they're, they're calling immunotherapy, so like that. nothing worked. So she said, I'm going to try fasting. She did a three-week or four week water fast, not just juice, water. And she said the tumor shrunk in half. It's no it was no longer an urgent situation. And uh Yeah. yeah and, and that you know remember, so, gosh. you you have the capability of surviving for weeks without water. With without food. Water you need for sure. Right. Water you need. Right. But a cancer cell which is so dysregulated, that does not have that same luxury, right? Exactly. That, that exactly. cancer cell is dependent on a constant supply of energy. So if you're not, if you're not getting that cancer cell, that, that constant supply of energy that it needs, then it's not going to have the ability to progress. And in fact, it's more than likely going to regress, especially if what you're doing is health promoting, right? Right. And this right. applies to not only people with primary cancers, but people with metastatic cancers. Because we have a lot of questions coming in. Well, you know, what if I have metastatic cancer? Or what if I have metastatic cancer from the start? This still applies to you. Unless you are, have an impending, like, again, excruciating spinal cord pain or brain herniation or something that is like an impending emergency, there is no reason why you can't do the same thing, take the same pause, take the same approach. You know, once you decide that you want to live, and that really needs to be your first commitment. Right. You have to decide that you want to live and that you're going to do the things that promote life. Because many of the things that people do on a regular basis do not promote life. And I will refer to one of the people that I know that you worked for, right? You worked for Dr. Atkins. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Look at him. Look right? what happened to him. He just fell yeah. on the street and died. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I have so many people, because I know that you, you promote a plant-based diet like I I promote a plant-based diet, and there are so many people who come to me and say, my daughter's on the carnivore diet, has never felt better. Uh, people, people frequently ask me this, and I say, you know, they may feel good in the short term because when you adopt that kind of diet, you eliminate other things. Exactly. You eliminate sugar, you eliminate grains, you eliminate processed food, you know, that kind of thing, because if you're going to go on the carnivore diet, you are eliminating those things. But in the long term, can you talk about what happens to the body on the long term carnivore diet, or I think what you will refer to as the corpse diet? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got it right. So, um, the, uh, and, and you, you were right on there when you, when you said um, um, that you, you start to feel 
feel better. So oftentimes, any mono diet, someone said, oh, you know, I just ate bananas and I got better. I just ate walnuts. Because whenever, if you went on a mono diet, it's not necessarily the thing that you are eating. It's all the stuff that you're not eating that is making you better. And the big thing with, the, with what they call the carnivore diet, which is mislabeled, um, is that you're not eating carbs, cooked carbs. Cooked carbs may be the most dangerous thing humans can eat. Um, um, you should get your carbohydrates in, in, in plants by eating the plant in its natural form. But when you cook it, like, for example, the farmer wants to take the pig and make a lot of money on it, uh, feed them uh, cooked potatoes, baked, baked potatoes, boiled potatoes. Then uh, they'll get fat quickly, right? And not so if they eat the raw potato. So something happens chemically in there. But um, the reason I don't call it, because a carnivore, has anyone ever been to... Well, you must have seen on, on, on either YouTube or TV, you must have seen a, a, a lion or a cheetah grabbing, chasing an animal, grabbing its neck, breaking the neck, and then eating it alive. That's a carnivore. So if you're not picking up that chicken, ripping its head off and eating it alive, don't call yourself a carnivore, okay? Now, if you're eating what dogs eat, which is dead animals, corpses, I mean, there's not an, I mean, we don't want people that no, don't, don't, uh, He's offen I'm not offensive. I'm just calling it a corpse. So is there another name for it? Uh, okay, it's not a corpse. It's a uh, dead body. Okay. So anyway, well, I don't know how else to call it. But anyway, so it's a, it's a it's scavenger diet. It's a dog diet. Now, by the way, did you ever hear that expression, healthy as a horse and sick as a dog? I wonder why. What do horses eat? What do dogs eat? You know, so, um, oh. oh, my God. I never thought anyway. about that before. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. you know, so the, the dog, dog food is, uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, if I was an alien and I came into this planet <clears throat> and I was going around, I went, I, I got to report back to the mothership and tell them what, what species these guys are with the two legs. So I, I go to dinner, I go to the dinner table of every country in the world. I'm going to have to report back during the canine species. They're dogs. They're, they're weird looking dogs because they're eating dog food. You see here in nature, the beauty of nature, because all animals are under the auspices direction of instinct, which is the divine web that uh, connects all creatures to God and to the knowledge and wisdom and divinity of God. So therefore, you cannot get a horse to eat dog food and you cannot get a dog to eat horse food. They will die first. We, we, we eat anything a cockroach will eat, including the cockroach. You know, we're, we're just like, you know, and so, anyway, um, when you're eating an, only an animal diet, you're not getting, I mean, if you're eating only, and when we say animals, you're not, you're not eating what the carnivore eats, because the lion is going to eat the liver, the, the ovaries, the kidneys, to drink the blood, eat all the undigested vegetables in the uh, small intestines, eat the heart, you know, and it's going to, and it's, what, if it saves something for the vulture, it's what you and I call steak, because it's going to get yeah. to that, that yeah. the good stuff. First, so, um, but all we eat is vulture food. We eat just the, just the muscle. That's all we eat. Now, yeah. that does not sustain life it, for us because it, there, there, it's lacking in so many nutrients. So, I mean, it doesn't have any phytonutrients and, you know, yeah, uh, well, if I was supposed to be vegan, uh, why do I have to take B12? Well, how come uh, you've got generational vegans in India who never heard of B12? Huh. What does B12 come from? Oh, it comes from microorganisms. Oh, so not the, you mean the cow doesn't make the B12 in his liver, right? In her liver. It's the microorganisms. Why do they have microorganisms in them? Because their face is in the dirt all day because they're not running around wiping everything off and they're not afraid of being earthlings. So they're getting all these microorganisms that are producing uh, B12 and it's being absorbed, okay? And so, in fact, we have some uh, bacteria in our colons that produce uh, cyanocobalamin of uh, B12, but we can't absorb it. You can only absorb B12 in your ileum. So I think what happens is if you are a vegan for a long time, maybe a dec couple decades, that those organisms migrate north of the colon through the ileocecal valve into up to the ileum. Ileum's long and feet. So, uh, into the ileum. And then th if those bacteria start producing the B12 there, it'll be absorbed. So, but it takes a long time. So in the meantime, yes, 
in the meantime, when you first start out, you got to take B12, okay. right? But listen, you're going to have the strength of, of a horse. You're going to have the strength of an elephant, of a hippo. That, that's, you know, so don't worry about not having energy, you know. So what else, um, other, what else other than B12 do people who are strictly plant-based have to think about? Um, well, really, you know, they talk about methionine, they talk about some of the amino acids, but it's just simply not true. If you're eating a well-balanced, I mean, you eat, like, in other words, when you have a salad, <clears throat> you know, you put everything, broccoli, cauliflower, spinach, cabbage, bok choy, uh, uh, kale, avocado, celery, cucumber, carrot, beet, sprouts, you, you know, just everything. And then learn how to make, like, at least, five or six delicious dressings because it's all in the dressing whether or not you're going to enjoy it that much and learn to enjoy it and learn to relish the taste of it. Uh, but you're going to be getting everything. So it's really only, it's only B12. Now, the only thing that none of us get, and this really goes down to, I really liked your post the other day um, on estrogens. That was very good. Um, the, um, uh, is iodine. Now, iodine, uh, as you know, the purpose well, you can thyroid. get it if you eat sea vegetables. If you what? If you eat sea vegetables, no, you exactly. get adequate iodine levels? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the only people in the world are the Japanese and Koreans who eat traditional diets. Because the average Japanese gets 13.8 milligrams of iodine a day from eating all the different sea vegetables. You're right. So like wakame, for example, that little square that's on top of your miso soup, bunch of little things of wakame, it can concentrate up to 30,000 times the amount of iodine in the water uh, into the leaf. So you don't get it from the sea animals like shrimp and things like that. They can't do it. But these sea vegetables do. But you're right. So in the old days, before we polluted the earth, there was a cycle where the iodine went up into the clouds and it rained all the way down to... Uh, the goiter belt, right, all the way, you know, in inland, and there was iodine in the, but now that's no longer happening. But, but that's why they had to put iodine in the salt. So the purpose of the thyroid is to deliver iodide. So iodine can either be as a single atom where it has a negative charge, or you can have two together where it's called molecular iodine. Okay, now iodide is delivered, all cells have a, a thyroid um, receptor. So it's delivered there, and the iodide actually uh, uh, depolarizes the mitochondrial membrane and causes the mitochondria to start producing energy. So that's why it's related to energy. And energy is heat. So you can, the best way, that's why if I have a T4 and T3 that are normal, but I'm feeling sluggish, you got to do what's called an electron spectrom spectrometry of that to see what is that three and four? Is that three and four iodines? Or is that two bromides and one fluoride and one chloride? Because yeah. remember, I iodine think fluoride is, a is a major problem in this country. Right, and it sits and it sits on our and our on our on our on our thyroid, our thyroid because it functions the same as iodine in, in, chemically. It makes salts in uh, um, so um, but so that's what iodine does. And by the way, the breasts and the thyroid are in the same meridian of the your tooth meridian the same meridian, and they are the two organs with the most powerful sodium iodide transporter system. So a pregnant woman <clears throat> is actually extracting more iodine from her blood than her thyroid gland is because of the sodium iodide transporter system. And that's because it is, the iodine is essential for uh, uh, the brain development. You know, that's why, uh, you know, someone who's born with hypothyroid, they used to call them a cretin. Cretinism was, was that. So uh, anyway, so iodine is really important for breast health. And the, re and, and the iodine, the I2, the reason you want to take Lugol's or Iodorol, um, uh, because they have I2 and I, they have both iodide and iodine theme, uh, because the I2 is necessary in the conversion of estrone into estriol. And estriol is fundamentally an estrogen receptor, beta, a beta receptor agonist, mildly alpha, whereas estradiol and estrone are alpha, and it's the alpha one that causes tumors to grow, and it's the beta one that makes them shrink, just like soy. Soy is 
a beta receptor agonist, you know, flax is. And in fact, you, they used to say, oh, you don't have soy, you have breast cancer. And then I would sit there and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. For as long as they've been measuring, Japanese are living 10 years longer than everybody else, and they eat soy all day. So, huh, can that be right? And it turns out it's not right. Yes, it's a phytoestrogen, but it stimulates beta receptor, which shrinks tumors. And it's mildly stimulating the, the alpha, which is great. Why? Because now nothing else you can get on it. So it's almost like a tamoxifen. It's sitting there blocking it. But you've yeah. but you got a major beta going on, so you're shrinking it. It's, it's like amazing. And who, 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 this is, you know, God to this. So um, anyway, that's the story about iodine, thyroid. And they're very, you know, the breasts and the thyroid are like uh, siblings. They are. Yeah. And we know that it, I think the point that you made that is so misunderstood is that fluoride can, and bromide can replace iodide. And when that's happening, we have all of this thyroid dysfunction. And thyroid dysfunction is a huge, huge, huge issue in the United States. And it's also tied to breast cancer. Um, when you look, when you do a Google search, you will, you will read a number of papers that say that hypothyroidism is not related to breast cancer. And if that's what those researchers found, maybe that's true, but I can tell you in my practice of 20 years of seeing thousands of women with breast cancer, the vast majority of them, their breast cancer diagnosis was predated by 10 years or more by a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Yeah. And it, yeah. it probably most of it started out as iodine deficiency. Absolutely. It, whether it's Graves or Hashimoto's, you know, as you all know, Graves is hyper and, and Hashimoto's is hypo, and they're both supposedly autoimmune. There's no such thing as autoimmune. The body is not stupid. God made it. It's not stupid. It's not going to oh, attack it. Oh, I made a mistake and I killed myself. You know, it's not like that, okay? Um, so if the immune system's doing something, it's because it's, it can see what we can't see. So it's after something. So anyway, when you have uh, insufficient uh, iodine, the immune system, you, your whole body is trying to adapt. And that, and you can, and I'm going to give you one example. I had a woman up here in, in, in northern Thailand who came in and she was, you know, anxious and blah, 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 blah. She was, she had graves. And we figured, I, you know, did a couple tests on her. She, she had graves. Uh, I mean, and she had really high antibodies and, you know, her, yeah, it's really high. So it took 24 hours of 100 milligrams three times a day of iodine. That's a lot of iodine. Yeah. Okay, so 100, 100, 150, three times a day. It took 24 hours. She was back to normal. Didn't need beta blockers, so she was back to normal. And so her thyroid function was normal because the, that amount of iodine will suppress thyroid function. However, and we had to adjust it throughout the years. However, it took three or four years for her antibodies to go away because those antibodies were in response to the iodine deficiency, like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And... It may not be that there's not iodine around, but if you have, but if you are inundated with fluoride, that will still happen. Yep. yep. Right. And so, right. and the fluoride, the fluoride is pushed from when these kids are tiny little kids, right? The the dentists want to coat their mouths in fluoride. They want to give them fluoride toothpaste. Extra fluoride toothpaste is prescribed all the time for adults. And it's crazy. It's, it, madness is it, like mercury. They would just like putting mercury in the mouth. It, it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, you know, fluoride, my God. Uh, and then fluoride also goes and calcifies the pineal gland. It's bad, yep. bad, 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 bad news. So, uh, and it's an industrial waste product. That's what it is. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So by taking a lot of iodine, you're just, it's like the law of mass action. You're going to kick out the bromides. You're going to kick out the fluoride. Yeah. Um, so I do want to talk about what the long-term ramifications are of that carnivore diet because I don't, I don't think we summed it up, and I know that, well, that everyone's so quick to voice concerns about the long-term ramifications of a plant-based diet, right? Where am I getting my 
B12 from? Where am I getting my vitamin A from? Where am I getting my vitamin D from? And there, and there is this perception that a long-term carnivore diet is, is healthy. And in my, in my opinion, it's anything but. And I think that it leads to any number of disease states. Right, deficiencies, because now you're depending on, you're depending on the, um, now, especially if you're grilling it and you've got, and you're not having it rare, but if you have it rare, which means it's still bleeding. So if you've got a bleeding corpse on your plate, then you're going to get the, you're going to get what was in the blood. So hopefully the animal had uh, a pretty healthy diet. Now you'll notice, I want you to notice something, all you would be, think you are carnivores. Um, so what do carnivores eat? They eat vegan. Why do they eat vegans? Because it's better quality flesh. They don't go eat another carnivore unless it's really hard up time. Okay, they eat vegans. Yeah, zebras, wildebeest. That's what they eat. They know what they're doing. They're, they're trained by God to be real carnivores. And if you want to be a carnivore, you got to get the whole thing. You got to get the whole thing. Now, the other thing the carnivores have is their livers are able to take protein much better than we can and turn it into glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis. So a cat, which is an obligate carnivore, has to eat, has to eat, eat. okay. Uh, a dog doesn't. You can feed a dog its whole life on vegetables. It'll live a nice life. It's a, it's a scavenger. It's an omnivore. Um, but a cat is an, an obligate. Now, they have a very high, strong ability to turn uh, protein into sugar. Because you still need all, all mammals. We all need this. And, you know, we're a thousand. We need the same things. We need carbs. We need all, all these. We need protein. We all need it. So they're just, they have a different, they're, a, they're serving a different purpose in this ecosystem, this, the biosphere. They're serving a different purpose, and their purpose is to keep the animal population down. And, but, but I'm saying they still turn it into it. So the long-term effects are, uh, you know, probably going to be based on the quality. Even if you ate grass-fed, and by the way, why do you want to eat grass-fed? Oh, that's right, because it's better quality. Huh, I got an idea. Why don't you skip the middleman? Why don't you become grass-fed? Anyway, um, uh, you're going to be missing a lots of phytonutrients, vitamin C. You're going to get all sorts of deficiencies. I worked for Robert C. Atkins, um, and I was a closet vegetarian, and he uh, he ate nothing but uh, it was just, it was like you know I couldn't even watch him eat. I can't. Uh, but he liked me. He liked me. He called me his heir apparent. He did only he only knew. But I watched him. I watched him three times. Fall on the ground, atrial fibrillation, uh, ventricular fib. He finally died. His heart just didn't work. Uh, and he was a young man. And in the last three or four or five years of his life, he couldn't fly because he couldn't get out. You know, he, his, his, he didn't have a good life. And this guy, ate, he ate the Atkins diet, right? The Atkins diet, which was stolen from the Brit British. The British knew it before Robert C. Atkins as the diet they gave to diabetics. Because with di if you give this to a diabetic, of course they're going to get better. And why will you feel better? Because if you're a pastatarian or a breaditarian, uh, which a lot of people are, then you're, you've got all this, I mean, I don't know what's worse, glucose or, or, or that. But anyway, you've got a lot of glucose going on, so you don't yeah. feel good. You, you, know, you, you don't feel good. So you stop eating that, you're going to feel fantastic, and you're going to say, yeah, this is for me. I've never felt better. Yeah, you never felt better. You give it a few years, and you're going to have all these deficiencies. You're not going to get what you need um, in, in, with all, all sorts of nutrients. And you're... Um, and by You're the way, probably going to get heart disease and cancer. Uh, yeah. I, mean, exactly. I think that I think that the data is pretty clear that in the short term you may feel better as a result of taking sugar and processed food and that kind of thing out of your diet. But in the long term, as compared to someone who is whole food plant based, you are definitely going to have more heart disease, more cancer. Absolutely, much. and. Then and, and both, of, both of the professional societies say it. American Card uh, College of Cardiology will, will, will back that up, and uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology will back that up. In fact, the American Cancer Society said there isn't a population in the world with a high meat intake that doesn't have a high incidence of colon cancer. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, like a, almost a direct quote from them. So um, this is not just stuff we're making up. And there was another, there was an interesting study. You know, the only people that do studies that are big studies are the um, – Seventh Day Adventists because they're they're vegetarians and this was very and they do they do studies with you know longitudinal studies with like two hundred thousand three hundred thousand four hundred thousand people so they're good sized studies and 
what's really weird is I've gone to Loma Linda, I've gone to their cafeteria, and it's junk vegetarian food. It's, you know, pizza with cheese, and uh, it's, it's not healthy vegetarian food. It's, you know, they forgot that vegetarian has the root vegetable. But anyway, so, um, yeah. so, uh, so, but what do they find? All cause mortality decreased in every category, heart, cancer, stroke, everything, even though they're eating junk vegetarian food, but they're not eating the meat. Yes, it's pretty amazing because it, when, when I talk about the diet, I talk about being whole food plant-based because Twizzlers are, are vegan. There's plenty of junk food that's vegan. You can live on pasta and call yourself a vegan. You're exactly. going to be extremely malnourished. You're not going to function optimally. But that, that's why I kind of stay away from that term because you're talking more about like um, politics or, you know, you, you, it's yeah. more preachy than it is uh, advocating for a healthy diet. So what we are talking about is whole food plant-based. Um, exactly. There were a couple and of, I, you know, I, I know you don't, I know you don't have much mm -hmm. time left, so I want to make sure that we talk about, someone asked, what are your feelings about low-dose tamoxifen? I know that my, I know my feelings, but I, I'd love to hear yours. Okay, all right, and j just real quickly, everybody go online later, look up a guy named Fred Bishi, B-I-S-C-I, okay? He was my mentor, um, okay? Uh, he was a bodybuilder, ate five steaks a day at age 40, got a PhD in nutrition, became a raw vegan at age 40. He's now 92, so he's been doing it, and he, he doesn't cheat. He's 52, 52 years of raw vegan. Check him out and listen to his mind. The guy's as sharp as, as any 20-year-old. He, he, he's sharp. Then there's another lady, Donna Peroni in New York. She's been 50 years. And then there's another lady, this, this, old, this older woman. She's like 80. She looks 40. So in, what are the long-term consequences of eating right? Mm, health and longevity. Okay, so um, tamoxifen. Um, you know, um, it's not, first of all, it, I, it's, I have to learn that it's not necessary. You get this, like I mentioned, you get the same, you get the same, um, you get the same uh, thing that you're looking for with uh, with, uh, uh, with with soy, the soy okay. phytoestrogens. Soy, you're getting flax. flax. You're getting mild alpha alpha uh, agonist, mild, but it's overridden by the beta. But now the alpha is blocked, just like the moxidin blocks it, but you don't get the side effects. You know, and toxin and, and, and tamoxifen is also there's a trade off. You're trading it off for another maybe a uterine cancer ten years yeah. later, five years later. So yeah. you know, I, I, you don't ever need it. And it's synthetic. And if you believe that estrogen causes breast cancer, right. then know that tamoxifen is a synthetic estrogen. So not, you're not taking the compound, the hormone that belongs in your body. In fact, you're giving yourself a synthetic form that doesn't belong in your body and is bringing with it more problems than it, than it solves. Great. So that, Great. that's my feeling about that's tamoxifen. It. What about your feeling about the aromatase inhibitors? Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting question, and I'm, I'm – because because we know that like in postmenopausal women, we know that uh, their their adrenal glands aren't really making a lot of estrogens. They're making mostly androgens. So and it's the aromatase it's the aromatase in fatty tissue mostly that uh, is able to convert it into estrogens. So breasts have fat, and so they find in some of these women that they actually have higher estrogen levels in their breasts than they do in their blood because they're 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 able to convert it. So um, you know in 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 that case, it'd be great if you can do it. But DIM, you know, DIM will do it. Uh, Dime the methane, which, which comes from eating uh, cruciferous vegetables. There's a way to get these things naturally. But, um, um, you, you know, and then there are some people that what I've done is uh, initially I put them on like a half a milligram of Arimidex three or four times a week, and that, or, or maybe one milligram twice a week, just enough to just block it a little bit uh, if they're postmenopausal and things like that until they get their diet worked out and all, you know, and all that. But once you have a lot of cruciferous vegetables, because remember, what we make is called, when we chew it and all that, and then we swallow, we have, um, 
isothiocyanates. When they get into the acidity of our stomach, they turn into diendomethane. And diendomethane, we know, is an aromatase inhibitor, right? So, um, you know, and there are other natural ones, too. What's the, the one they use for prostate as well? Um, well, uh, it's all palmetto. But yeah. what yeah, yeah. you, but the other thing that you're referring to is that we can get a lot of these aromatase inhibitors from nature, like from mushrooms and onions and garlic and the allium family. And so, you know, if you are of normal weight, I, I, I mean, I can almost promise you that it's not the estrogen in your body that is causing any dysfunction, and we really need to be looking in other areas. And if you are on the proper diet, moving your body, sleeping, and including these foods and nutrients in your diet that will uh, optimize that microenvironment that we were talking about, you don't need those things that, exactly. you know, aromatase inhibitors don't come at no cost, right? They are accelerating right. heart disease, they're accelerating bone loss, they're accelerating dementia, Alzheimer's, depression, anxiety. I mean, this is not nothing. Right, right, right. They, they, and all drugs have what's called an LD50, is a lethal dose at which 50% of the people die, okay? So... Remember that, and they have to have that. They have to know the LD50 in order to get it uh, approved. So, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and, and what, what you're saying is, is exactly right on. And so, you know, yeah, yeah, and here's the thing. What we're talking about really is restoring balance, right? Because et, it's not that estrogen is bad and uh, what, what would be good? I don't know. Whatever they think is good. But anyway, it's, they, you know, you, the first part of the cycle estrogen. Second part, progesterone. It was made that way. Yin-yang, it's got to be that way. And you'll notice they never make a big deal over progesterone receptor positive. Why? They don't have a drug. Otherwise, if they had a drug, they'd make a big deal about PR positive, but they don't. They do HER2 and they do um, PR positive because they've got drugs. It's yeah. a sales algorithm. And, and we should say that People who say, but I have a tumor that's driven by estrogen and progesterone. You should all know that normal breast cells have both estrogen and progesterone receptors on them. They're supposed to. That is normal. That is normal. Right, right. So, you know, ovaries, tubes, fallopian tubes, vagina, even your hips. Oh, by the way, what a lot of people don't realize is the estrogen receptors on lungs, pancreas, colon, bladder, right, and prostate. And so even men with the men who have prostate cancer, they need to have, if you've got a husband that has a prostate, has a problem with that, he's got ER beta too. So he needs to eat as much soy as you do so to, to get and to keep his, his, his prostate down, right? So it's good. And, and, and it turns out it's, it's associated with colon cancer, and they don't always – do it. They, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll look for the, for the uh, epidermal growth factor, uh, the HER2, in, in colon cancer, but not always. Uh, but they get, they're really focused on breast because they got these drugs and they know it's a big seller. And they also know that somehow, I don't know how, we don't know how, we're going to only speculate, uh, breast cancer became such a big deal worldwide. Even indigenous cultures are now, so, uh, are now getting it, which is supposed to be a lifestyle um, cancer rather than an infectious cancer. But even they're getting it now. So you got to figure out what are we doing to them? Why yeah. is it so big? So we gotta re the bottom line is restore balance, clean out, and then eat food that God, nature produced, right? Don't eat. Remember, anything that we get our hands on becomes it goes into the artificial column. It's artificial. Okay, what God made is natural. And the good thing about nature, it doesn't make garbage. It doesn't make trash. Right? A one animal's excrement is another animal's nourishment. There's no, there's no trash. We make trash. Tons of it. We're good at it because it's our artifacts. So when we take a tomato and we turn it into tomato sauce, we destroyed it. We destroyed what nature gave us. Nature gave us all of the nutrients in a synergistically co combination that we couldn't comprehend. And here we're saying, well, you know, if you, if you just boil it longer, you'll have more lycopene. Yeah, but there's no lycopene trees, you know. So, you know, I don't think we just need lycopene. We need the whole thing that the tomato has. So I'm, my, you, like you said, plant-based, whole food. And by the way, how many vitamins do you find in steak? You don't. Except the B12 from the blood. 
So, um, oh my God, I'm just drawing a blank. So when you have, when you, when you talk about restoring balance, cleaning out, eat food that nature produced, go to sleep early, are there any other things that people should be thinking about before they have to, before kind of getting into all of the pressure of this is, this is what you have to do, right? What other things can people do on their own? Oh, and I do, there is a question here about, do you eat any cooked food or is everything you eat raw? And I wanted to know that too. Yeah, no, no, I, I was 100% raw for only about four or five years when I was in New York. And uh, it's like, it's like, you know, we're at it. You, know, you don't have one, right? You, you know, like a cigarette smoker knows if they quit, don't have that first puff. Anyway, so I would say I'm 80-20 now. And, um, I'm really happy when I go back to LA, uh, back to the U.S. I'm at Oasis, and I have a raw kitchen again. I Then I go 100%, and I just feel so amazingly good. But, um, yeah, yeah, and the degree to which I don't feel good, I don't have energy, I can attribute to eating an, uh, thermally denatured food, which is also known as cooking. Um, but the other thing that we can do and that we have to do and that it's really overlooked is, uh, has to do with movement. Uh, there's a lot of really good, interesting studies coming out um, about exercise and some of the myokines that are produced uh, that they can actually slow down and stop cancers. Um, they, stimulate they stimulate mitochondria. And remember, cancer is a mitochondrial problem. They stimulate mitochondria, and they even are now looking at the longevity prognosis with a cancer diagnosis uh, can be, uh, one, one way you determine it is grip strength, grip strength, wow. girth of your wow. gastrocnemius. So, uh, and, and you get these by, by, by recruiting the type 2 muscle fibers, which means you, uh, like, like, for example, if you, go, if you had a little stool and you, and, you, and you get with one leg and you step up on it slowly, Right, you're putting all of your weight on that on your thigh, right, and your and your glutes, and then when you get up, then you get all the way up, then go down slowly, and it's that return, slowly return, which is a different kind of movement that really will recruit these type two muscle fibers that will give girth to your muscle muscles and give you strength. So really, like we have a guy with a kinesiologist at our our, our center, and uh, we we one of our big goals is to get people's grip strength up before they leave. Uh, I had a lady leave yesterday who's, I think she's, she went up 5.7 uh, in her, in her grip, up, up from two something. So, yeah, very, very important. So movement. And here's the thing about movement. You know, sitting at a desk for eight hours and then going to a gym and freaking out for two hours, both are as equally as unnatural. So set a little alarm, alarm clock, no matter what your job is. Every 90 minutes, you get up, go outside and take 10 minutes and get out of breath. Do a bunch of jumping jacks, push-ups, uh, crawl on all fours, not your knees, all fours, crawl forward five times, five times, five times, forward, five times, five times. Um, just do all that, get out of breath, and come back and sit down. Just 10 minutes. It makes it easy. That's very important. And then the big one, the big one is this, it's the muscles. Don't, don't forget that. Um, um, imagine if you were just the torso, what you wouldn't give to be able to get up and walk. Um, now, uh, the other thing is this, the, the immune system is kind of the shadow of the mind. So if you're, if you've got really bad news, you're, you're afraid, angry, sad, regretful, your immune system is going to be low. Uh, and, and if you're happy, it's the opposite. And the problem is, is that 80, what we know as psychology, from psychology is that 80% of human thinking is negative and 90% is subconscious, meaning we don't know what our internal dialogue is. So. You can just now, with that information, you can assume that as long as you're thinking, you've got your foot on the brakes of the immune system. And we know that because when we do studies with catheters in people's arms, checking their blood, the minute they go into a no-thinking condition of, of meditation, their natural killer cells, their gamma interferon, all of it increases just by turning off the mind. So it's not easy to do because, you know, you know, because thinking's not voluntary. It's a, it's a happening just like your heart is a happening. So the only way to, uh, to I mean, the best way to do it is, is treat it like a muscle, just five times a day for two minutes. Sit down, and if you pray to God, make, your, make a little prayer, and then sit back, and for two minutes, listen to your breathing, your deep breathing, because that's where God sits, is your breath. Yeah. And, um, 
and uh, just listen to it, and you'll you won't last more than five seconds, and then you'll be off in the other room and quickly when you come back down. And try it. And it's only two minutes. You can do two minutes five times a day. Do that, and after a month, you're going to develop that little mind muscle to shut off the mad person inside of you. So, very 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 important. And and I real, one real quick one. We, what we have here in Thailand, I can. I can take someone's blood out, spin their, uh, send it to a lab. They spin out the natural killer cells, and we measure the gamma interferon. And if it's below 200, they're in trouble. If it's above 500, they're okay. So if it's below 200, then we give them some more. Then they, what they do is they put them in a dish. They activate them with IL-2 and IL-12, get them activated, put them in a growth medium, expand them out, and then we give the person back 12, uh, 10 billion of their own uh, activated natural killer cells uh, like every week. All right? Now, if they're afraid, got a terrible relationship, within 24 hours, those cells are inactivated again. That's how powerful the mind is. You cannot underestimate it, and you cannot neglect it. Absolutely. Okay, because you, and what, just, it's just what like, you think about growth, right? What you think we, about growth. So you need to be so intentional about what you want to grow. Exactly. Um, exactly. We did have a question come through what about fruit what's your feeling about fruit oh my gosh that's the hardest thing in the world for me fruit I think I think we're frugivores it's our natural diet um, you know not exclusively but I mean it's you know well it's part um, of a different behavior right I mean part of survival was to be able to withstand the times of scarcity and be able to store fat efficiently when we had times of abundance. And summers with fruit were times of abundance. So the reason that it's so sweet is so that it tastes so good, so that we are driven to eat it and eat a lot of it, right? Right. And so it's kind of innately built into us to overeat things that are sweet. Right, right. That, yeah, uh, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I'm over here. I'm lucky, lucky enough, fortunate enough, blessed enough that I get to eat fruits that are, not, that are not hybrids. So we got these little bananas. They're real little guys. And they have seeds. I never ate a banana with a seed in America. I only have with these foot-long Chiquita bananas. But um, uh, anyway, um, the, so fruit is, 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 is a combination of fructose and glucose. So... The difference between those two in terms of cancer is this. Glucose stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin. And cancer cells have, like, many, many, many more insulin receptors, so they grab it quickly. Fructose does not. So the more fructose you have, you're, you're, the fructose, yes, cancer cells can eat fructose. On the GLUT5 receptor, is specifically for fructose. Okay, so it can eat fructose. However... It doesn't stimulate insulin, so therefore it doesn't preferentially feed cancer. So if the cancer is eating at the same rate as the rest of the cells, for, for the cancer cell, that's a relative starvation because it needs 19 times more glucose because it's 19 times less efficient at energy production. So therefore, uh, uh, fruit, I, would, I, I wouldn't eat, um, I, I would stay away from dried fruits and, you know, like dates and figs and things like that. I wouldn't eat bananas. And, you know, once in a while, no big deal. But... Eat mostly the low glycemic ones, and when you eat fruit, always eat it alone. Never eat it with anything else. It's not an appetizer or a dessert. It's a meal. If you eat it with anything else, it will get delayed and it'll start to ferment. So you don't want that to happen. So and you'll digest it more easily. Fruit is readily digestible, and uh, and especially if you're enjoying it, relish it. Every time you enjoy something, you just had an immune boost. So and that's why sex is good. Have sex, enjoy sex, orgasm, fantastic. You know, um, for a man to keep his prostate healthy, for all, all you women who have husbands or boyfriends, um, uh, he has to ejaculate 18 times a month minimum. So. Oh, don't tell my husband that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's got, well, you know, give him a magazine. Give him a magazine sometimes. But, you know, right. he, um, it's got to, it, it, it just keeps, because, you know, think about it. I think, I think the benign prostatic, hypertrophy, the large prostate that men get, older men get, part of it is just congestion because it's not being emptied. It's just a boo 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 Yeah. It's underused. It's true. It's absolutely true. 
Um, and, and, you know, you make an excellent point um, that actually has a lot of pertinence in this group because um, sex is a driven behavior. It is, you know, um, the, the way to get vitamin O, which, which is our oxytocin. It's our, like, joy hormone. Um, it's what we're filled with when we hug our children and mm -hmm. kiss our spouse and with orgasm. And I think the conventional medical treatment for breast cancer is so, um, it's the antithesis of having a healthy sexual relationship because most of it does everything it can do to wipe out your sex hormones. And without sex hormones, people really struggle with libido, with mood, with sleep, with uh, vaginal dryness, with pain, um, and with urination, with, it, with basically with everything. And exactly. It's really hard to have a healthy sexual relationship when you have no desire, when you have discomfort, you, you have dread. Uh, and, and so we really, and we have completely ignored that and ignored its importance. I 100% agree because, uh, you know, what, what, when I, um, you know, I used to, practice psychology before medical school. So uh, when, when I look, look what happens to elderly people, there's a couple, there's, there's two major events that happen to elderly people that I think it, it precipitates their major, major decline. One is retirement, because you lose your identity that you've developed over the years. And this identity, you as whatever you were, whatever you did, that's gone. Now, your hormones are going down. Now you lose your sexuality, your sexual identity. These are major, major aspects of who you are as a man or what, you're, a, you're a beautiful, sexy woman or a sexy woman or whatever, or you're a good-looking guy. Or, that is part of who you are, or just, and, and, and sex is part of it. So uh, just in terms of psychologically, it's very important. You know, for, I mean, I can tell you, I can't tell you what it would be like to be inside of a woman's body, but I can tell you inside of a man's body that, um, sex, you know, healthy sex just makes everything inside my psyche better. I mm -hmm. feel better about me, about the world. I, it's just, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like putting your feet on the ground or something, but it's something so primal and natural. Remember, biological organisms were really designed to do two things. Extract energy from the environment and make babies. So eat and sex. You know, we do a few more things. We do a few other things, but I'm just saying it's really, really important. So keep doing it. And by the way, the Hunzas, the women are delivering children at 65, and the men can still get women pregnant at 110. So I think what we have here is a very accelerated, premature aging program. We do, and and we see it, right? I mean, you know, we may have some degree of longevity in this country, but think about what people's last 10, 15, 20 years of their life are like, right? They're, yeah. They're basically, they're, they're discarded, right? They're discarded from their jobs. You, you called it retirement, but really what happens is that they're discarded from their jobs. Yeah. So yeah. they no longer have a purpose and a place in society. And then because of the way that most of us live our lives, rushing from one thing to another, eating a diet of convenience, not moving our bodies, not resting or nurturing our minds and our thoughts, living with, with toxic thoughts and toxic guilt in a sea of toxic soup. And yep. then we are, the last 10, 15, 20 years of our lives are spent in and out of a revolving door of a hospital going from one medicine to another medicine to another procedure to another medicine to another procedure. And we are not, we may be living long, but we're for sure not living well. Exactly. And in the end, we get swallowed up by machines in an ICU. That, you know, when I, when I go into ICUs and I look at them and I see the people, they're literally being swallowed, eaten by machines. It's, 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 it hurts me so much to see that. 
and I and I kind of look at the person and I want to ask them, but I don't. I would never say such a thing. But my question would be, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Was that cheeseburger? Was that staying up late? You know, you know. Here, it's not that we have to stop having fun. It's not that you can't go out and dance on Saturday night. Do that. Do that and love it. But it's what we do most of the time that will define our overall physiology. So normally go to bed early. Normally do give yourself a blow a day. You know, do that. Do that and enjoy it and don't feel guilty about it because it's good for it's 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 you know what we what I call that and what I call meditation is psychoneuroimmunology, and that's exactly what it is, psychoneuroimmunology. Yeah. And I, I love what you said. It's, you don't have to be perfect. It's what you do most that matters. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So I, go I, out and I, party. Yeah. I think I mean, that's that, a great place to end for today and let okay. you get to your beautiful day. Oh, thank you. I wish I, 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 can't I, wish thank I could, you enough for I being I here. show you how beautiful. It is. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so, someday. I promise I'll come visit. Someday. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, bring, your, your husband and his pros- bring your husband and his prostate. I, I sure will. <laughs> and we will do this again real soon because we had a ton of questions and a ton of interaction and response. And I know people really love this. I'm going to post it on my Instagram. It's going to post on your Instagram. I'm also going to post it on my YouTube channel. So if you're not following my YouTube channel, please do. Dr. Jen Simmons. I think I'm Dr. Jen Simmons everywhere. And I will have you on the podcast real soon. We'll get you scheduled for the Keeping Abreast with Dr. Jen podcast. If you're not part of my Facebook group and you didn't get your questions answered today, please join my Facebook group, Keeping Abreast with Dr. Jen. And I will be sure if you don't like my answer, I will get you the answer from Dr. Lodi. I love it. But please, uh, I enjoyed it so much. I love talking to you, and I love your questions. I love your knowledge. I mean, it's amazing to talk to uh, someone who gets it, knows what I know. So I love this beautiful. Thank you. Well, and, uh, um, thank you to I, all your I audience. I could listen to you. Endlessly. So any opportunity that I get to hear, to hear you share your, your life experience and your perspective, which is so unique and amazing, and, you know, no one walks your walk. So there's really no one else like you, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to have access to you. Well, thank you. And, and likewise, absolutely. I really mean it. All right, everyone, like Dr. Lodi said, it's time to get to bed early. Yeah. Um, Until next time, it's Dr. Jen. Bye for now. Bye-bye.